I mean, to say that we actually house the world's largest 3D printer automatically, I just, I know that it's about the aerospace industry and how it's going to revolutionize the aerospace industry. The first question really is how? Uh, thank you very much for having me on the show, Faith. Um, the AeroSwift machine was built to be one of the largest, actually the largest uh, metal 3D printer in the world because it was seen as a need, you know, for aerospace industries for parts, large parts, because the current machines that are available now commercially are restricted by their size. So the AeroSwift in total, it can print up to two meters in terms of the part size that one can pr produce all, all at once. So that is why the machine was built and it was done as, you know, a project between the CSIR uh, Aerosuit, which is an aircraft manufacturing company, and funded by the Department of Science and Technology. Now on that, I mean, the ability to print um, anything matter within two meters that is large, is it just limited to the aerospace industry, or are you able to utilize, especially when it comes to 3D printing, utilize it for, for other uses, especially given the fact that of the magnitude and what it's able to actually hold in capacity? Currently, with the project, it was aimed at aerospace because we already had a strategic partnership with Aerosuit. But as part of the phase three that we're in now as uh, the Aerosuit project, we're looking at our commercialization and industrialization strategies. And this includes looking into other markets such as the rail industry. We look, we're talking to the automotive industry and internationally, the tooling industry is also looking at additive manufacturing but not necessarily on a scale that the aerospace industry might need, but these machines, because of the skills that we've built, can then be custom made to what the customer's needs are. I mean, obviously, when you're looking at 3D printing, number one, it's an issue around don't be saving time, right? So it's time, uh, uh, less time, it's, it's effective, it's more efficient. On the other side of it is the issue around quality, right? And this is where now the checks and balances must actually happen. Quality control. How do you ensure that there is no situation where you find that a part was installed or the, the printing was done with an error and therefore affecting an entire design and not only that, an entire machinery? Yeah. So currently the, the, the um, additively manufactured parts are subjected to the same standards as your conventionally manufactured parts. But as uh, researchers in the additive manufacturing industry, they saw it as important to actually develop standards that speak specifically to the additively manufactured parts. And also you find that our... Um, your, your part suppliers, they're actually, you know, uh, coming on board in terms of providing some of the properties that they would like to see in additively manufactured parts in order for them to put them in application. Because we do have to make sure that the parts that we are producing are actually qualified according to uh, international standards. Mm. I mean, obviously, when it comes to the issue around qualifying them, now th there's one part. It's a win for science. However, when it comes to manpower, and manpower goes into the issues around employment opportunities. It's a big win for science, but it's another thing for employment opportunities, especially when you've got a 3D printer that is able to do the job at half the time, at more accuracy, and obviously it's more commercial and it's commercially viable. How then do you stop mitigating against that? Because as soon as it goes onto market, you know for a fact that many individuals that are linked to some kind of union or another, whichever industry there is, they're going to be quite scared and jittery at the introduction of a machine or equipment that is able to do the job more accurately than half the time. Yeah, I think since, you know, all the other revolutions that has gone through in terms of the manufacturing from automation to using machines to using robotics, there's always that fear in the beginning of, you know, uh, jobs are going to be lost. So additive manufacturing, because it's one of, uh, one of the technologies, you know, that are central to the fourth industrial revolution, we do understand that uh, there's some skills that will not no longer be needed but at the same time, you know, we are opening up the market to new skills because now you need people who are highly skilled in designing these parts, in qualifying these parts, in determining the materials properties, in building these machines. So at the same time, as much as, you know, it might look like we are losing jobs, we are actually gaining very highly skilled individuals who will be needed in order to take advantage of these technologies. I really wish you and I could spend the entire day talking about this. Obviously, it's big when it comes to innovation as well as for IR, but we're going to have to leave it for um, there for this afternoon. We've got Ndombi Mato, who's a senior researcher at the CSIR. There's a reason to feel patriotic uh, on a Tuesday. We've got a uh, home to the largest 3D printer. That is us. And still to come, Brazil has rejected pledges from G7 countries to help fight the fires in the Amazon. This after Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau offered a $15 million donation. That story is up next. Stay with NewsHour.